Almighty God, we come to you and thank you so much for this opportunity, this chance to be in your house, to worship, to hear your word. And God, we pray that uh, this morning you would touch our lives in a special way, that you would change us from the inside out so that we look, we sound, we, we act more like your son, Jesus Christ. So guide us and direct us this morning and open us up uh, to the truth of your word. We thank you again, and we pray all of these things in your son's name. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're sitting down, take your Bibles or your apps, and, and turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Now, uh, before I get started, I want to give some praise reports from this past weekend. Last weekend was Easter weekend. Uh, here at Calvary, we had five services, and between those five services, we almost had 2,200 people on our campus for Easter weekend. And we can clap, and that's amazing, but the best thing is we baptized on Passion Week 21 people. Isn't that awesome? But in saying that, we want to thank all of you who volunteered, those of you who switched services over to Saturday night so that uh, these seats could be open on Sunday morning, on Easter morning. Uh, we want to thank you because your sacrifice, your volunteering uh, was what made it happen. And so thank you so much uh, for listening to God's voice and following his calling uh, last weekend. People got to hear the word of God, uh, maybe for the first time because of the sacrifices uh, that you as a congregation made. So thank you very much. Now, uh, let me catch you up. We're in John chapter 20. Let me catch you up to what has happened up to this point. Um, it's Passion Week. It's just past Passion Week. So Jesus has made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He has spent the week teaching and preaching and, and pretty much upsetting all of the religious leaders in the Sanhedrin. He's had the Last Supper with his disciples uh, he's been arrested, he has hung on the cross and died on the cross for our sins, uh, laid in the grave for three days, and on that third day he rose from the grave. And so that is what has happened up to John chapter 20. The resurrection has just taken place, and the women have gone to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body, and what did they find? The stone's been rolled away, they go in, nobody's in there, and all of a sudden they look over to the side, and there's an angel, and the angel says to them, hey ladies, He's not here. He's risen. He's alive. And so the women go back to the disciples and report that Jesus has risen. Peter picks up his robe and takes off, goes to check it out himself, and comes back and reports, yeah, I didn't see an angel, but the tomb is empty. And that's where we're at right here in John chapter 20. You can follow along with me starting in verse 19. So what have the disciples been doing up to this point? Uh, they have actually been hunkered down in a locked room in Jerusalem, hiding from the government. They're scared out of their minds. Because think about it, they've been following a guy for three years. They've been dedicating themselves to everything that he stood for. They've been pursuing the mission that Jesus was preaching about and teaching about. And now, the man that they've been following for three years was hunted down by the government and killed, executed by the government. Now, put yourself in their shoes for a moment. If you had been through their experience and your leader had just been hunted down and killed by the government, wouldn't you be afraid that the government was going to come after you next? That's what they're afraid of. They are scared to death that any moment a group of Roman soldiers are going to come to the door and knock and arrest them and haul them off. So they're in this room. They're hiding. They've got everything locked up. They're spending their time praying and eating and praying and sleeping and sleeping some more and praying some more and maybe getting a snack. And basically, they're just kind of hunkered down in this room. And as time passes, they get hungry and decide, hey, we're going to draw straws and whoever gets the short stick gets to go get food. And so they draw straws and Thomas gets the short stick and they go, okay, in and out is just down the street. We want some kosher double doubles. Uh, we want some kosher four by fours. Uh, so in other words, no cheese. Hey, you laugh, but I've been to Israel. in and out would be a delicacy over there because, uh, yeah, the food's not to be envied. But, of course, I'm making this up, but in chapter 20, verse 19, we find that the disciples are all in this room, but Thomas is not there. You with me so far? In other words, there are 10 disciples. Thomas has left to either run an errand or go do something or pick something up, but he's not in the room 
with the other disciples. And what has happened, or what happens while he's gone? Jesus appears to those ten disciples. So think about this for a second. Thomas is now the one and only dedicated follower of Jesus Christ who has not seen the risen Christ. Kind of the odd man out, right? Because the women have seen him, the other ten disciples have seen him, but Thomas has not. And so Thomas comes back with his bags of in and out, and he walks in the door, and when he had left, everybody was somber, everybody was praying, heads were down, spirits were low, and when he walks in the door, what does he walk into? Jesus is alive! Jesus is alive! Yeah! Yeah! Right? Because they just saw Jesus in the flesh. The man that they saw die four days ago appeared to them in the room in the flesh. Thomas was freaked out a little bit, I would imagine. Because things had completely changed in the time he was gone. And so he walks in, the disciples and the women are jumping for joy. They're excited, they're going, Thomas, you missed it, dude, it was awesome. He appeared, he said, peace be with you, it was amazing. And Thomas goes, <laughs> no, I don't believe you. Thomas's response is literally, I tell you what, fellas, if he appears and he can show me the holes and I can stick my fingers in the holes in his hand and put my hand in the hole in his side, then I'll believe. But until then, no thanks. I want nothing to do with it because I don't believe it. Dead men do not rise from the grave. Well, what about Lazarus? I'm sure they had that conversation. Lazarus rose from the grave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But think about it for a moment. Jesus, or Lazarus was raised from the grave by a very alive Jesus Christ. A dead man can't raise himself from the grave. It's not how it works. And Jesus died on the cross. So a dead man can't raise himself. So I'm not going to believe you guys. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for the proof. I want to see him in person. I want to stick my fingers in the holes. Pause for a second. Because at this point in the story, we hear what Thomas says and we go, what a loser. Why did Jesus pick that guy, right? We think of him and we go, he had no faith. He was a weakling. He wouldn't believe even with all ten disciples and the ladies telling him that Jesus had risen. Why did Jesus pick that guy? But think about it for a minute. Thomas had dedicated three years of his life to this man. And his belief, as was the belief of almost every Jewish person in that society in that day and time, they believed that the Messiah would come and not just revolutionize things spiritually, but they thought that that Messiah was going to come and kick the Roman government out and take the throne as the physical king of Israel. And now where's Jesus? Thomas thinks he's in the grave. He saw him die on a cross. And so Thomas, think about it for a moment. If you were in his shoes, your emotions would be crushed. You would be devastated at a level that none of us in this room can understand. Three years of your life thrown away, pursuing a man that got executed by the government. And now you've got nothing but doubts in your mind and your heart. I challenge you, I think if any of us were in the same circumstances as Thomas, we'd probably respond the same way. Because Thomas was crushed. He had no hope left in his heart. So now fast forward eight days. Eight days later, pick up in verse 24. Eight days have passed since Jesus appeared to the other ten disciples. And they're all hanging out, doing what they've been doing for the past week and a half. They're praying, they're eating, they're sleeping, they're praying, they're eating, they're sleeping. That's all they're doing in this locked room, trying to hide from the government. And what happens? They're praying, doors are locked, Jesus appears. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden Jesus is in the room. And he looks at the guys and goes, peace be with you. Which is biblical talk for, what's up fellas? And he looks at them and then immediately puts his attention on Thomas. And he looks at Thomas and he goes, 
Come here, Thomas. Stick your finger right here. This is the proof you wanted, right? Stick your fingers right here because I'm here. And what's Thomas's response? No, thanks. I'm good. I believe. Wow. Can you imagine being in that room in that moment? I mean, I imagine Jesus had just appeared again. And so I imagine there's a level of excitement and energy in the room because there's Jesus. He's here. Not only is he, he didn't walk in the door, he appeared. This is awesome. Not only that, I imagine the room was a little heavy also because Jesus just approached Thomas. What do we call Thomas? Doubting Thomas. And he called Thomas out right there. Come here, Thomas. Put your hands, put your fingers right here in the holes. This is the proof you needed, and I'm providing it for you. Wow. Can you imagine being in that room in that moment? Now, this brings me to something that I want to ask you. Looking at Thomas's story, we have to ask, is it okay to question? Is it okay to question? Now, let's face it, we're human beings, aren't we? And as humans, aren't we kind of built to question everything around us? Don't we kind of, by instinct, question everything we see? Yeah, we do. Look at our kids. I mean, some of your kids say the word why more than any other word in the dictionary. We're going to go to the store. Why? Go wash your hands. Why? The sky is blue. Why? Right? Kids are driven by questions. They question everything. But it's one thing for us to say, let's question why the sky is blue. It's a whole other issue to say, let's question whether Jesus rose from the grave. Is it okay to question biblical things? Is it okay to question what God has told us? Well, let's look at the story of Thomas. When Jesus appears in the room, he goes, what's up, fellas? And then does he look at Thomas and go, you, get out. No. Does he look at Thomas and go, you are horrible. You should feel ashamed for questioning whether I had risen from the grave. Did he do that to Thomas? No. What did he do? He provided the proof that Thomas said that he needed to believe. He looks at Thomas and goes, stick your fingers here. You wanted the proof. You said that you would believe if you could touch the holes. So come here. Touch the holes. Put your fingers in them. Feel that I am here and that I am alive. He didn't condemn Thomas. He provided the proof that Thomas needed in the moment. Well, it's just one story, but let's look at the rest of the Bible. Guys, is, is the Bible not full of stories of men and women who questioned God or doubted God, and then God took their story and redeemed the whole thing and did amazing things with it? Yeah. Look at Abraham, 100 years old. God looks at him and says, Abraham, you're going to have a son. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm 100 years old, and you know how old my wife is? That ain't happening. That's what he told God. And what happened? Sarah got pregnant. They had a son named Isaac. Guys, do you know what the name Isaac means in Hebrew? It literally means to be laughed at. In other words, God told Abraham to name his son to be laughed at because Abraham and Sarah both laughed at God when he told them that they were going to have a son in their old age. He took their doubts, disproved them, and then did something amazing with them. Guys, Isaac becomes the ancestor of the nation of Israel, who later becomes the ancestor of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Take Moses. Moses, standing in front of a burning bush. He's in the presence of a physical miracle. And God says, Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt, and you're going to set my people free. And Moses goes, <laughs> no. And then God says, no, you're going. And what does God do? He sends Moses and Aaron, and they lead the people out of the land of Egypt. And Moses leads the people the rest of his life. And Moses is one of those men of God that we look to and go, that's someone we model after. 
Look at Gideon. If you're familiar with the story of Gideon and Judges, Gideon was a nobody. He was the least in his family. His family was the least in his tribe. The tribe that they were a part of was the smallest in the land of Israel. He was a nobody. And God comes to him and says, Gideon, what's up, you strong warrior? And Gideon goes, me? God says, yes, you. And he takes him through this process. And later on in the process, God says, I'm going to send you to build an army and go attack and drive out this uh, group of people that have oppressed you and put you in slavery. And Gideon says, eh, you, eh, you've done some great stuff up till now, but I don't know that I believe you. Can I put up a test? I'm going to set this fleece out in the lawn. And what I want you to do is make the fleece wet with dew, but leave the ground dry. Wakes up the next morning, what is it? The fleece is so wet that he can wring it out like a wash rag. And the dry ground is all around it. And what does Gideon do? Does Gideon go, oh yeah, I totally believe now. No. Gideon looks at God and goes, that's awesome. That's really great. And, but can you do that again only in reverse? And God says, yeah, set it out there. What does Gideon wake up to the next morning? The fleece is bone dry and the ground is nothing but mud. Then Gideon goes, okay, now I believe you, God. And he goes on to take an army of 300 men against an army of thousands and defeats them in the name and power of God and does amazing things by setting the captives free and then leading the nation of Israel as a judge for the rest of his life. Guys, the Bible is filled with stories of men and women who doubted and questioned God. And God did not condemn them for their questioning and doubts. God provided the proof they needed and then did amazing things with their story in their life. So I think that I can safely say, yes, it's okay to question. It is. Guys, we all have questions. We all have doubts and don't feel like there's anything wrong in that. But it leads me to the next question. What does it take to convince you? If it's okay to question, then what does it take to convince you? Look at Thomas's story. What did he have around him as proof? He had the women and he had 10 of his best friends who had been with him for three years telling him that Jesus had risen from the grave. And did he believe them? No. What did he say? If Jesus will appear to me and I can stick my fingers in the holes, then I'll believe. And what did Jesus do? He appeared and gave him the opportunity. What did it take to convince Thomas? It took Jesus Christ appearing in the flesh to him to convince him. But guys, I hate to be this way. I seriously doubt whether Jesus Christ is going to physically appear in your bedroom and show you the holes to convince you. Probably not going to happen. I hate to be that way. So what is it going to take to convince you of Jesus Christ? Look at verse 29. John chapter 20. This is the conclusion of this whole Doubting Thomas story. Verse 29. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We live in today's world where we're probably not going to see Jesus physically, face to face, and have the opportunity to stick our hands, our fingers in the holes. So what is it going to take to convince you? Well, let me challenge you with this. Follow the evidence and seek to understand. I am giving you permission right here and right now from this stage to challenge everything. Question and test everything. Including what's spoken from this stage. Because that's the biblical model. Want an example of this? Go to Acts 17. You've heard the Apostle Paul, uh, the the book of Acts is mostly about his journeys. He was the first great missionary of the church. And in chapter 17, he was in a place called Thessalonica, uh, where we get the letter Thessalonians. He was in Thessalonica, and God called him to leave Thessalonica and go to a place called Berea. And in Berea, this is what he said about the followers in Berea. Acts 17, verse 11. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness and examined the scriptures daily. 
to see if these things were so. In other words, Paul came, he preached, he taught. They knew exactly who Paul was, and they looked at Paul and said, listen, we hear you, sounds good, but we're going to go check our Bibles real quick first before we take it at your word. We're going to go test this against Scripture before we believe you. Guys, test everything against God's word. The reason the Bereans were considered called noble by Paul and Luke is because they tested everything. It wasn't an insult to Paul that the Bereans went and checked the Bible to make sure that what he was saying was true. It was a compliment to him. And he saw them as noble for doing it. Guys, test and challenge everything. But here's the hard part. God is wanting and providing the proof for all of us. But we're so lazy that many times we don't go looking for the proof. How many of you remember that 1980s uh, Encyclopedia Britannica commercial? Anybody remember those old commercials? And it was the little boy sitting at the desk and he yells down the hallway, Hey mom, how much does a whale weigh? And the mom yells back, Look it up, dear. And in the commercial, what was the kid's response? Ugh. Okay, and he pulls the encyclopedia down and starts doing the research. Guys, God has provided the proof and the research, but we have to be willing to do the work and go looking for it. We have to be willing to do the research and do the study necessary to answer the questions and doubts that we have in our minds and hearts. So do the work. I know too many people who, rather than humbling themselves and recognizing that God's truth and the proof that he provided is true, rather than being humble and recognizing that, they just said, you know what? I've already made up my mind. I haven't heard both sides of the argument, but I kind of like the idea of being an atheist. So I'm just going to do that without hearing the Christian side. A lot of people have not done the work. And as a result, they're missing out on something. So do the work. Test and question everything that you see in here. Test and question even things that you hear from your friends or things that you read or see on the internet. Yes, the internet is not 100% true, contrary to popular belief. Don't just go sharing everything that comes across your Facebook feed. Check it out first. Go look it up. Go make sure that what you're saying is the truth and that you're not spreading more lies. The fact is, is that God's provided it. We need to go looking for it. Don't be that guy that has the wrong motives and instead of seeking the truth, has already made their mind up without getting both sides of the argument. Don't be that guy. The other difficulty in this side of it is that if we're truly convinced, we should live like someone who is convinced. But how many of us, we say we're convinced that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and yet... We go out and we have sex outside of marriage. Or we cheat and manipulate others. Or we live in greed rather than living in generosity. Or we put our faith in horoscopes and fortune tellers rather than in God's word and the promises in it. Or we allow anger or jealousy to destroy our relationships. Or we get drunk and we make horrible decisions as a result of it. Or we just generally live like people who don't know Christ. If you believe that Jesus Christ was a real man who lived on this earth and lived a sinless life and died on the cross to save you from your sins and sat in the grave for three days and then rose from the grave and then ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, if you believe that, live like it. If you're going to convince others of the doubts they have in their faith, you have to live like Christ. And so don't act or, or don't say that you're convinced and then have your actions contradict that. Live like someone who is convinced. Don't let anything less than that happen. So it's okay to question. But it's only okay to question if we seek the truth and we seek to understand God's truth. That's the only time that it is okay to question and doubt. If you question and doubt and you do nothing about it, that is what's wrong. But when you seek the truth, it's okay. Because ultimately, doubt can strengthen your faith. It absolutely can. Doubt 
can strengthen the faith that you have. And my story is a great example of that. I've told this story and I'm going to tell it again because it fits perfectly here. I got saved when I was in fourth grade. But guys, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Don't get me wrong. I grew up in a wonderful home. My parents were amazing. I loved my mom and my stepdad. Great home. Wonderful people. But we did not go to church. And we didn't talk about Jesus at our house. It wasn't something that we did. In fourth grade, my uh, biological father's mom, my grandmother on my dad's side, decided that she was going to send me to church camp. She wanted me to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And so I went to church camp after fourth grade, and I did experience that life change. I stepped into a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and it changed everything about me. And in middle school and high school, I went to church all the time, and everything I did, my friends that I hung out with, the, the things that I did, the activities that I participated in, everything was partially at least partially dictated by my faith. And I lived out my faith when I was in middle school and high school. But then I graduated. And I'd been taking biology classes and physics classes, and I had a lot of questions and a lot of doubt. And so when I got into college, I majored in biology with an emphasis in evolution. I wanted to grow up and be a researcher, an evolution researcher at a major university. That was my dream. That's what I, I hoped for. And so I went two and a half years into that major, studying the classes, doing the work, learning the theories and the science behind it. And two and a half years in, I realized that evolution did not explain where we came from. The science of evolution did not explain our origins. The Bible explained it. The Bible explained that we were created uniquely by God and that he loved us and he cared for us. And I realized that evolution, us coming from single-celled organisms, did not line up. The science didn't make sense. And so two and a half years into my major, I stepped back and said, you know what? I'm wrong. And God's right. And so I changed my major, and I turned my back on the dreams of hoping to be an uh, evolutionary researcher at a major university, and now look at me. I'm, I'm a pastor on a stage, kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, I would say. But the fact of the matter is, is that I can stand up here with you right now, and I can, without a doubt in my mind or heart, tell you that my faith is stronger because of that college experience. I have more knowledge about the Bible and science and how the two work together. And my faith is stronger as a result of it. And the great thing is, this is not a coincidence at all, this is a God thing, is this Thursday, this past Thursday, I got to sit down with a student in our youth ministry and talk to them about science. She sat down right in front of me at a restaurant and said, Chad, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm hearing this and this and this in my uh, science classes, physics and evolution and, and the things I'm learning in world history and about world religions and philosophy. It doesn't line up with God's word. And I don't know how to rectify that in my mind. I'm doubting my faith. And so we sat there for over an hour and a half talking evolution and science in the Bible, talking world religion, talking about history and philosophy, talking about all these issues and these difficulties that she was having and continuing with her faith and, and yet hearing what she's hearing at school. And at the end of our conversation, she looked at me, and I still don't know who she's talking about, but she said, I'm really glad I talked to someone smart. I, I don't know who that was. Um, but needless to say, she also looked at me and said, I feel better in my faith now after having this conversation with you. Her doubts and her questions were there, but what did she do? She called up someone that she could trust and got the other side of the argument. And as a result, she walked away from that conversation stronger in her faith because she did the work, guys. She didn't take those doubts and questions and go, oh, well, my science teacher must be right. I'm going to turn my back on my faith. No, she went and got the other side of that argument. 
and made sure she pursued the truth of both sides. And as a result, her faith is stronger today. It's okay to question. It's okay to doubt. But test and challenge everything. Don't take those things for granted. Don't take what I'm saying up here right now for granted. Test it against God's word. And make sure that what I'm telling you is the truth. Seek God's wisdom and truth in your questions and doubts. Get the answers from him that you need so that your faith can be strengthened. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for this opportunity to be here, to study, to hear your word and worship. And Lord, we pray. We pray that we would learn from Thomas. That we would learn, Lord, that it's okay to question, but when we do, we need to seek your face. And we need to seek to understand your truth. So help us to do that today. Help us to grow in you and learn in you and strengthen our faith in you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And we lift all these things up to you in the name of your Son and our Savior and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.